This is a recording for your notes on populations. Uh, let's remember that a population is a group of organisms of the same species living in a particular area. And here you have a population of blue crabs, which are very common in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, when we study a population, we want to learn everything about a population per se, because sometimes we want to increase their numbers, sometimes we want to try to decrease their numbers if they are pests, sometimes we want to try to maintain their numbers if it's a population of an organism that we want to eat, like these Chesapeake um, blue crabs. So ecologists are always trying to learn about the populations and to try to determine how best to manage them, especially the ones that are of importance for humans. Uh, there are a number of characteristics of a population. One of the things that we always want to study is their actual geographic distribution. Basically, where are you going to be able to find these individuals? And that is also sometimes called the range. <clears throat> So we want to know exactly where you find these organisms. Another aspect that you want to know is their density. How many individuals are there per unit of area? Not just in total, per unit of area. So if I have here two areas, area A and B, and in this one I have, and the areas are the same, pretend my rectangles are the same size, here I have two individuals and I have here eight individuals. Obviously, this is going to have a higher density, number of individuals per unit of area, and that is also going to have an impact on the resources that they need. Remember that they need food, water, mating, mates, uh, places to nest or to be able to reproduce safely and so forth. If we are talking about animals, we can also be talking about plants. And a population of plants, of course, one of the factors that you are going to need to worry if you have a population of plants is, for example, the amount of light that they get, the amount of water available, and the amount of nutrients available in the soil. Remember our nitrogen phosphorus components. Finally, the other thing we want to know about our population is the growth rate, how the number of individuals changes, either increases or decreases over time. So let's continue on the population growth. How is gonna so when we talk about growth, it's not growth that they are getting fat, it's growth in numbers. Okay, so let's be specific about that. When we talk about growth, it's growth in numbers of individuals over time. There are three things that are going to affect this. Basically, the birth rate. How many offspring you have? How many offspring you have? Remember that in plants, offspring are the seeds. Those are their babies. Uh, and that, of course, birth rate, how many births, that is going to increase the population. Then you're going to have the death rate that is obviously going to decrease the population. And this could be due to natural death or to predators or any other factor. And finally, besides the birth and the death, the number of individuals in a population is also going to be determined by factors such as immigration, basically individuals that come in that are going to increase the numbers or by emigration, individuals that leave that all obviously decrease the numbers of a population. So all those factors you have to take into account and try to quantify them when you are doing ecological studies. What do we know about growth? We know that there are two types of growth, one that is more theoretical and one that is more realistic. Uh, the first type of growth you need to be familiar with is what we call exponential, because this looks like an exponential curve. And in your next slide, you have all the details of what I'm going to be mentioned here. 
So this exponential is also called a J curve because it has a J shape. And this model assumes that resources are unlimited. In order for the individuals, notice here is numbers, here is time, we start here and let's say we start with two individuals here. If we use bacteria as an example or a protist, a simple organism, over time two, especially if you, divide, uh, you reproduce by binary fission, you're going to have two, then four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, and I'm going to stop there. If you plot those numbers in a curve, you get this kind of curve. This type of curve also assumes, like I drew here, that the reproduction is at a constant rate, always doubling, always doubling. This kind of grow, growth is only going to occur under ideal conditions, and under ideal conditions, and under unlimited resources. And with that, you probably know that there is no such a thing as unlimited resources that all of those are going to be limited and there is always competition. So if that curved exponential model of growth is not realistic, what is the real thing? The real thing is the logistic. And think of the name, logistic is logical, makes sense. So this is the real thing. What happens here? And again, in your next slide, you have some of the uh, concepts that I'm going to be discussing while using the curve. <coughs> Here we have again number of individuals, and in this case, for example, they're using number of yeast cells. That again, increase in numbers 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so forth. Doesn't matter what the organism is, number of organisms over time. And of course the scales are going to change depending on the organisms. For unicellular creatures, hours are enough. If you are talking about mammals, we need to talk about many, many, many years sometimes or only months if we're talking about mice, for example. So the scale can change. So if we use this example, this is exponential growth. So the population is increasing relatively fast. Notice that this part of the curve is the same as the other one. So kind of up to here is very similar to the exponential growth rate. Nothing different. However, as we get to a certain point, notice that the curve starts changing and slowing down and from then on it's going to be up and down, up and down, up and down along this average there. What's happening here at this point in the, of the curve is that there are fewer resources, fewer resources. They are becoming scarce. And when the resources have become limited, the reproductive rate increases, uh, decreases because a few of, fewer offspring can be produced, less resources, you can have fewer babies. So slowly, because resources become limited, the curve tends to flatten. And it flattens when it reaches what we call the carrying capacity, the carrying capacity of the environment, the carrying capacity of the environment. This is the maximum number of individuals that the, a particular environment can support. The maximum number of individuals that a particular environment can support based on the resources available. 
One important thing about this carrying capacity is that it can change from environment to environment, from species to species, and even for the same species, it can change from year to year based on the environmental conditions. So if you have a year, for example, when you have a drought, if you have a drought, you are going to have fewer producers. Fewer producers produce less food for the rest, so the carrying capacity of the system is going to decrease under those conditions. If you have a year with abundant rain and abundant light and resources and the number of producers increases, obviously that can cause also an increase in the carrying capacity of many of the organisms. So carrying capacity is not a fixed value, it fluctuates depending on the conditions. So let's review this in a little diagram here. So we have the population growth that can be of two types, exponential growth or logistic. If exponential growth is characterized by no limits on growth, unlimited resources and a constant growth rate that produces this J-shaped curve. On the other hand, your logistic growth, this is the one that we find in real life, is characterized by limits because resources are limited in the environment, which are going to cause a falling growth rate eventually, and it's going to produce what we call an S-shaped curve. Notice that this has kind of like an S shape. And the key element of this logistic growth, growth, blah, blah, growth is the carrying capacity of the environment. Carrying capacity of the environment. I have real data here. I have some real graph. So you can see that this is not something fixed and that you can predict all the time. So here example is the Nevada mule deer population. The mule deer is slightly different than the deer that we have here that is called the white tail deer. So this is data from 1980 to 2004. And notice the mule deer population was around between 100,000 and 150,000. And so if you look at, you need to look at the blue curve here. The carrying capacity for this first set of years was someplace around here. It's never gonna be a perfect shape because uh, populations fluctuate. For this section over here between 95 and 2004, the carrying capacity is someplace around this value. And over here, these years were extremely good for the uh, deer population. You can see that the numbers increase and the carrying capacity of that environment changed. So what happens when you have a carrying capacity? And in this case, this is another deer population in Walla Walla Island really nice name. The carrying capacity here is often around 80,000. So if you introduce the deer to this island, that's what happened. The deer started reproducing. Nice increasing numbers, increasing numbers, increasing numbers. And notice that they went over carrying capacity. You need to remember that it takes a while for the deer to have their babies. So they kept on eating and even though food started running out, the babies came a few months later. So overpopulation. This is overpopulation. Too many deer, not enough food. So what's going to happen? Individuals are going to die. And then the population is going to oscillate, oscillate always around this value. It's never going to be able to stay perfectly flat 
because the organisms don't say, oh, wait a minute, dude, we already are at our carrying capacity. We cannot have any more babies. That doesn't work that way. They keep on having babies. The babies are born. There is not enough food. They die. So, and that self-regulates the growth of the population. When enough people, enough individuals die in case of the deer, then there is extra food available, so they reproduce a little bit more. Then they die again because of lack of food and so forth. So the populations always fluctuate around that average value of um, carrying capacity. And remember that this value can change. A population in a bad year might be reduced. Please never think that those beautiful graphs is what happens in real life. That's not true. So I have a pop an example of an aphid here. Aphids right here. These are small insects that feed in plants. They have a, they stick their proboscis, kind of like the mosquitoes. They bite us and suck up uh, blood. These ones basically suck up the uh, fluid through the phloem of the plants. And here you have what happens to this population in a year, from April to April. Pre-constant, aphids pre-constant most of the year. Then they reproduce in the, in the fall. The population increases. And then what happens through the winter? Most of them die until you go back to basically the small numbers that are characteristic most of the year. Two other cases, and I want to introduce you to the idea of predator prey again. Predator prey cycles. We're gonna look at this in a minute. Predator prey cycles. Let's do that in a minute. I have two curves here. I have a fox. The fox belongs to this dotted line. The rabbits that are the prey is the bigger line. Of course, you have more prey than predators. These are the predators. Remember our um, food webs, food chains, and pyramids. Uh, over here is the values of uh, population size for the fox. And here is the population size for the rabbits. I'm sorry, your slides, I cut off the numbers. So my question is, what is the current capacity of these populations? Ooh, tricky. So for the predator, this bottom line, you basically have to go for the kind of average. And the average comes pretty close to one. If you go for the prey, Notice that they fluctuate from year to year, so you just go for kind of average across this whole thing. And this fluctuation is driven by the predator. Please notice you have a high number of prey here at year five. And of course, if you have a lot of prey, the predator is going to have a lot to eat. So the predator, notice here, starts eating them, so the predator goes up, and as the predator is the prey, the prey comes down. You get a peak in the predator, but then the predators have eaten a large number of prey. So what's going to happen to the predators now that there are not enough prey? Well, the predators are going to decline, and as they decline, the prey have a chance to reproduce again and reach peak numbers. Yoo-hoo! We have a lot of rabbits! So the foxes that are here start eating rabbits and having babies and increase their numbers. Unfortunately, they eat so many that the rabbit population goes down. And when the rabbit population goes down, guess what happens to the fox population? it goes down. And the cycle keeps on repeating itself, with the prey determining the predator and the two of them constantly up and down, up and down. That's a predator-prey cycle that I'll show you again 
in a minute. You have a similar map, same thing, predator prey cycles, and this is not the fox, this is the lynx and the arctic hair or snowshoe hair. And again, you can see here the two different scales. Here is a scale for the lynx, which is the predator. Notice the numbers, always fewer predators at the top of the chain. And here is the prey, that is the snowshoe hair, uh, the link, sorry, the snowshoe hair in black right here. Notice the scale that is totally different. And now if you look at real values, these are actually real values, you can see always that the snowshoe hair peaks and after the peaks, here later on comes the peak of the predator, the lynx. And they keep on going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, pretty much forever. So if we look at this and I ask you on this graph, determine the carrying capacity of the environment through these almost 100 years, for the lynx, for the lynx, that is the predator, that is the red line, eh, on average, on average, on average is about three, the carrying capacity. If I ask you for the hair, that is the prey, that is the black line, it fluctuates significantly, but on average is some place around maybe 60. So those are predator prey cycles. So finally, two more things. Factors that limit the growth of populations. There are two types of factors. One that we call density dependent. And density dependent depends on the density of the organisms, their numbers. So these are always going to be impacted by biotic factors, by other living creatures. And examples of things that are going to affect the numbers that are density dependent. Remember, I told you the clue here, biotic. Competition. The more organisms have, the more competition. That's why it's density dependent. If you have fewer organisms, you're going to have less competition. That's why it's density dependent. Predation, predator-prey interactions. The more predators, the poor prey are going to suffer more. Parasitism, the more parasites are going to definitely affect the host significantly. And then in terms of disease, <coughs> those especially infectious diseases that are ca caused by microorganisms like viruses, bacteria. Again, if you have more organisms, think of coronavirus, more humans, more infections. That's why they impose the six feet separation and the limits on groups of people because is density dependent. The transmission is density dependent. The more separation, the fewer people, the less transmission we're going to have. And the population of the viruses are going to be affected. The other, of course, if there is density dependent, you're also going to have density independent factors. And what is the clue here? All these density independent are what we call abiotic factors. It doesn't matter how many you have. You might have 10 or 200. These are going to affect all the organisms equally, regardless of their population size. What kind of things are these? The weather. Here comes a storm, here comes a hurricane, it doesn't matter, all of them are affected. So, well, I have it here in natural disasters. Uh, let's add this, the droughts. A drought is a long period with less rain than 
normal, much less rain. Here you have an example of a drought. The organisms die for lack of water. The first ones to die are the producers, of course, and then follow the consumers. Uh, we have seasonal cycles like El Niño and La Niña, Ooh, missing our Ñes, El Niño and La Niña, and these are um, oceanic weather patterns that affect the climate on land. And so when we have either El Niño or La Niña, that means that at least in the United, in the United States, in North America, we are going to have a much wetter year or a much drier year. And it's not usually years, these cycles are about three or four years at a time. So when you are under El Niño, you get more rain, more uh, weather instability, La Niña is kind of the opposite. But again, these affect all organisms. And of course then you have human activities, like when we cut down forest. Here you have a nice mountain, and here this area was totally cut down. There is absolutely no tree. Just You just see the road there that they use to have access and remove all the trees. When you have this kind of situation, it doesn't matter how many individuals of uh, plants or other organisms were there, all of them are equally affected. And finally, pollution. Again, there is no mercy. Everybody gets affected independently of if the, your population size. So remember, independent is abiotic, dependent is biotic. And with that, we are closing on populations and the factors that might affect their growth. I hope this helps. Thank you for listening and I will see you in class.